Okay, well, we are uh, looking at today, uh, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1. We looked at verse 1 last week, and in that verse 1 came a lot of information about who Peter was speaking to, and uh, we broached the subject of the elect exiles and, and who that meant because they were from the diaspora or the dispersion, as some of your translations might say. So we talked about how some people would define that as people of Jewish descent, meaning that they had been um, cast out of Jerusalem and Judea and other countries because of the persecution, but even not so immediate persecution, but it could have even been from centuries before because they had, um, God had removed them from uh, Jerusalem on different occasions, down through when the Assyrians took them over, when the Persians took them over, when the Babylonians took them over. So it could be of the Jews uh, is who he's writing to. That's what I kind of think. He's writing mainly to Jews, not just Jews though, but also Gentiles, where other people think it's mainly the Gentiles. Um, and I told you last week, I'd be, I would give you a verse that a lot of them would cite that, that seems to point that direction, okay? Um, so, and, and this was it. I didn't cover that last week, so I wanted to show you. 1 Peter 4, verse 3. Look at what it says. For the time is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this... They are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So, based on the English Standard Version, and I highlighted that, that that's really important. Um, not only the English Standard, but if you would go to the NASB, if you would go to the NIV, they're all going to be very similar to the top, okay? Which is what I just read. But look at what it says there. They, they lived in those things. It says, for the time is past. The time that is past, that's enough of living in those things. Then look at verse 4. Now they're surprised when you don't join them in those things. So a lot of translators would say that this is saying that Peter is saying, to the Gentiles, listen, you once walked according to the Gentiles, and now you don't join them, okay? And most of them would say that the Jewish people would not have walked according to those ways, okay? So, is that how we could understand that? Yes, we could. But we could also find many times back through the history of the Jewish people where they did walk in those ways, okay? So we don't really know what's exactly going on there. And it could kind of go both ways, I think. It could go, it could go both ways. And, and even what I showed you from the other text, looking back through Acts, looking back through all the times and all the persecutions that Paul suffered and, and his accompaniment suffered, a lot of times it was suffered from the Jewish people. So, here again, look at what Jesus suffered from the Jewish people. Look at how he was ridiculed. Look at how they plotted to murder him. So, again, this doesn't, it, it doesn't lock it in for me. I understand he could be writing to um, Gentiles as well. But the reason I put up two verses here it's two different translations. Look at the bottom one. New King James, okay? Now this goes back to what translation or what group family of text that your Bible draws from. The top one would be the Alexandrian text. That would be every translation, I'll use that term loosely, but I would say almost every translation. In fact, I don't know of a translation other than the King James Version or the New King James Version. They are the only two 
that don't draw, that I'm aware of, that don't draw from the Alexandrian text. The bottom is the Byzantine text. And again, this is important. Well, why is that important? Because look at how this reads. 1 Peter 4, 3. For we, Peter is now, according to this, he is including himself. Either himself or himself as the Jewish people. We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, rowdy dream, and the rest of the text is very similar. But you see that there's a major difference here because Peter is including him and also, I would say, the Jewish people in with this. Okay? Now, again, this all goes back to the difference of the text. The Alexandrian text is the top, Byzantine is the bottom. And if you have a new King James or a King James, you're going to have something along these lines of, as far as the translation. So, again, it, it really depends. Uh, if, it, and you can, for me, the fun part is working through this, reading the commentaries and see how they handle Because we're going to run into this again because he's going to talk about how you learn traditions from your fathers. So what does that mean? Um, and, and, and to me, it's, it's interesting because each, each person then, because of how they divide this verse, are then going to, they have to divide that verse the same way. So, and they try to work these phrases out and try to understand it. So, and that's helpful. We'll look at that and we'll go through that. But like I said, for my purpose, I believe Peter was writing mainly to Jews. I believe that there was Gentiles. I know there was Gentiles mixed in. I've supported that because of um, going through the book of Acts and looking at how Paul lived. Remember, Paul preached through the lower portion of Asia. And so we have a very good record. If you remember the map, it was, it was a very local um, congregation that, that Paul moved. Local, local, local. To, to different cities throughout. And it seems as if Peter possibly went to the upper portion. Remember that map, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia. Um, it seems that that was the case. Uh, we don't have a record of that, but we have a record of Paul. So we'll leave that. And, and like I said, this will come up again, and, and we'll run into it again. So today's verse, uh, verse number two. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then the last phrase there, grace to you and peace be multiplied. One thing that stuck out to me was, notice I highlighted it, you have the Trinity involved here. You have God the Father, you have the Spirit in sanctification, and you have the cleansing or sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So I thought that was important. Um, the elect, who does that refer to or what does that modify? And I would say it modifies the, um, it, it's pointing to the sanctification, the ones who are being sanctified, the ones who are elect, they're elect, why? Because of the according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. They are sanctified in the Spirit, and then they are obedient, or it's for obedience, and the, the purification, the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. So those three different phrases, okay? So first of all, we have to look at what elect means. This word is using, uh, used, yeah, using, this word is used, um, around 23 different times. There's different forms of it. Um, in the scripture, I'm saying in the New Testament, in the Greek word. And elect just simply means to choose or elect in the exact same sense as the way we elect a leader. We have a pool of leaders or pool of people to choose from. 
and we choose one or we elect him into the office. It's used the same identical way in Scripture. God elects or God chooses, okay? So, and, and this is the way that Peter understood it. Remember, Peter's writing, I believe, mainly to a Jewish congregation. And so they would have been very familiar with this because the people of Israel was God's elect. He was, they were God's chosen people. So, and, and we'll look at verses, but here, here is um, Peter using the same exact word. Again, 1 Peter chapter 2, okay? He says, you are a chosen and elect. It's the same Greek word. It's only translated two ways, either elect or chosen. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may do what? That you may proclaim the praises of him. Who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And in verse 10, here's another one where they would say that this is pointing to Gentiles. Okay, because it, look at what it says. Who were once not a people, but are now the people of God. And, and so that's where they would say that doesn't refer to the nation of Israel. Because they was a chosen people. And again, that's one of those verses here that leads me to believe that, that he is talking to some Gentiles as well as to the Jewish people. Um, and here again, I would kind of qualify this to say too that if we're talking about maybe people that were not spiritual Israel, Paul uses that term in Romans chapter 9. He says, not all of Israel is Israel. There is Israel the flesh, but then there is the children of promise that came through Isaac. So Paul clarifies it in that way. And I would think that that's probably more what he's, he's talking about here as well. Could be a number of different ways to understand it. But uh, it says you have not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. So again, just to show you, it just means chosen. Here's Matthew 22. Uh, we'll just skip down. You know that all of this is the, it's the, the man that didn't have the garment when he came to the wedding feast. He wasn't covered. Um, in the garment, he wasn't dressed properly, and again, it's, it's foreshadowing of, of a time to come. Whenever you're not clothed, or garment, clothed in the garment of Christ, you don't have his righteousness, you'll be cast out. Um, and then verse 14, for many are called, but few are eclectos in the Greek, uh, in the Greek chosen, elect, same, same exact word. Romans 8, 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. If you remember from this portion, um, this just goes on and on and on. It's called the golden chain of salvation. It involves the foreknowing, and we'll get into that later. So, Colossians 3.12, Paul often used this word. In fact, most of the New Testament is Paul's writings, and he used it um, the most of all just because of most of it's his writing. So, um, the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. So this electing, remember I said this would be very familiar to the Jewish people. And here's one of the, I mean, here again, it's used a number of times in the Old Testament. But Deuteronomy 7, 6, this one here, I like this because this really... This really spells it out here. It says, for you are a holy people. He's speaking here to the people of Israel. You are a holy people to the Lord, Yahweh, all caps, Yahweh your God. And Yahweh your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. Yahweh did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were least of all the peoples, but because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, Yahweh has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage 
from the hand of Pharaoh the king. So, again, God is choosing a people in which he's going to work through. Okay? And, and a lot of people really struggle with this election issue. But if you think about it, God only chose the people of Israel to move through. He only sent the prophets, or he only revealed himself to them. He only worked through them. He only gave them his covenants. He only gave him, them, his promises. And that's not fair. Right? I mean, that's, I'm with you on that. Um, but yeah, that is what the Bible clearly teaches. And that is what God did. And that doesn't mean that the other nations couldn't come to him. That's not what that says. And, and in fact, we, we actually see that. Where people from the other nations were drawn because of the children of Israel. They were drawn to God. And, and here again, you remember from the, the scarlet thread that runs through. Remember Rahab the harlot. Remember what she said? We have heard of the mighty deeds that your God has done. And remember, she was faithful. She was faithful and she assisted the spies. So we find that other people could still follow God. And they did, oftentimes, through the Old Testament. So, don't, it, yes, God only moved through the people of Israel, but it didn't by any means, it didn't exclude the other people from coming to faith to him, okay? So he says a, a special treasure above all the earth. So again, I think this is bringing through when he says, when Peter says, you are elect exiles. You are people that are chosen of God. You are elect and God has not abandoned you. God has chosen you, and he is with you. Um, so you can see how the word elect there involves so much more. If it's a Jewish congregation, it, it, they would understand more. Either that or whoever taught these people before must have really taught them well. So that they would have understood the idea of being elect. And, and that could be the case as well. Because Paul oftentimes writes in his letters, and he uses the same terminology. So my guess is they were probably pretty well taught as well. And that would even be even better because they could actually ask him questions, um, and, they, and, and then he could explain. So they were elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So again, foreknowledge is one of these words. It, it's kind of simple. But yet, there's a lot more involved in it um, to understand it completely. Acts, it's used a couple times through Scripture. Acts 2.23, this is speaking of Jesus, Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge. And, and that's what this word is, prognosco. Prognosco, sound like a word that we use? Prognosis, okay? He was chosen, he was determined by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God. And he says, you have taken by lawless hands. So that would be the Romans, that would be the Jews, that would be um, everybody involved with the crucifixion of Jesus. And you put them to death. It's also used in Romans 8, 29. For whom he, God, foreknew, prognoso, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And this is the golden chain of salvation here. Um, he predestined. What? He predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, and, and so the chain continues, whom he predestined, these he called, whom he called, these he justified, whom he justified, these he also glorified. So it's a completed chain. It's a completed task. And it, it starts from the beginning. And what is the beginning? It's the foreknowledge of God, okay? So there's a, there's a couple different ways that we can understand that as well. Some people think that, that God chooses people because he looks down and he knows when the gospel is presented to them that they will choose him first. And then because they will choose him, he chooses them. The only problem is the scripture just doesn't teach that. Scripture teaches that he says... 
I chose you. You chose me because I chose you. And just there are just so many verses in Scripture that just blows that out of water. Um, honestly, it, it, it makes very little sense. And it definitely twists the whole idea of electing or choosing. It's just, I, I struggled with it for years, I'll be honest. Um, and, and I was, I came from a denomination that would teach that in a sense, but, but not really teach it, just kind of like on the down low. They would just never discuss it. They would never take a look at these verses. They would never work through these verses. Um, and, and that was something that always bothered me. And then whenever I was, it was finally revealed to me, and somebody actually taught it. And by the way, if you're not familiar, John MacArthur would teach this way. He has an excellent series on it. And, and um, uh, Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon would teach this way as well. Um, and, and he as well, you can look through his sermons, um, very clear teaching um, and very scripture-oriented teaching. So, and there's many others. John Piper's another favorite of mine. So um, either way here. Now, it's interesting, this foreknowledge doesn't just only mean that he knew before he, okay? And, and I'll show you what I mean only by using these verses, okay? New King James Version, look at this. From Genesis 18, he says, For I have known, okay, and that word in the Hebrew now, because it's in the Old Testament, yadati, I have known you, okay? And that word just simply means to know, to hear, to learn, or to reveal, to be, or to become. Okay? That's what that word means, and depending on the context, how it's used. But look at what he says there. I, God, have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, and that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Okay, so he says, I have known Abraham. Does this mean that God didn't know anybody else on the earth? Of course not. God knows everything. God knows every heart. Remember, Jesus even taught that. He knows the hearts of men. So then this knowing brings about everything in Abraham's life. He says, I know him in order that, or so that, he may command his children. Okay? So look at the ESV here. Now, in, in this text, it is the exact same word. Yadati. The exact same word. And look at, look at how they translate it. For I have chosen him that he may command his children in the household. The exact same phrasing then. But look at, I have chosen, when you say, well, it doesn't mean chosen. You're right, that word doesn't. But look at the context. And so that's why the ESV changes it and says that I have chosen it because that's clearly what it means. But yet, correctly, the, the New King James uses the word no. Because that's exactly what the word means. And you can still understand that from the text. Okay? If you have an NASB, it'll do the same thing. The NASB and the ESB and the New King James are the three most literal versions. Okay? The NIV is a paraphrase, so I don't usually draw from that one. I only want the literal versions. And that's why this is really important to me, because... To me, it, it just proves it, that foreknowledge is not just alone the ideal that he knew them, but yet he was active, active in them. Okay, Tom? Uh, listening and reading there, I, what captured my attention there was that, uh, <laughs> that the, the way of the Lord. Yeah. Uh, and... My understanding of the way of the Lord uh, is by the way of faith. At this time, the the uh, 
the law wasn't given, correct? Yes, correct. The, the law wasn't given, so... That would have came later through Moses. Right, and so therefore, uh, God had uh, chosen Abraham, uh, but in the choosing of Abraham, um, he did it by faith, the yes. same way that we are saved today, till then, but uh, I'm ca captured by the Lord, by, um, by keeping the way of the Lord, what does that mean? What's your understanding of the way of the Lord? By well, doing doing something, um, yeah. it seems like as if it's earning as opposed to by grace. Yeah, but here, here's what I see. The way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Okay? But if you look to what Paul wrote in the New Testament, Remember, he says Abraham was justified by works, or, or by, by, faith. by faith, not by works. Okay? Right. So, um, to me, they're, they're, not, they're not separate. Because I, I believe that the same way James taught, if you have faith, you mm -hmm. will have works. If you don't have faith, or if you have, in James' words, if you had a dead faith, then you'll have dead works. So to me, they're not, they're not separate. If you have one, the other one comes with it. So, but I would say the way of the Lord, I, I mean, you, you could say faith, you could read that into that, but I would say just from this text, the way of the Lord is by doing righteousness and justice, okay? Um, so again, the way of the Lord is righteous. And if we are walking in the way of the Lord, then of course we're walking by faith. And if we are walking by faith, what are we going to do? We're going to be following His commandments. And we're going to love Him. Remember Jesus' words, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. And then He flips it around and says, if you don't love me, you won't follow my commandments. So, and that's why I kind of read them in the same, it, because they're not separable. It, you have to, if you have faith, you're going to have works, and if you don't have a, a faith, uh, or it's a dead faith, or, or a demon faith, because that's an option that um, James gives as well. You can have a demon faith, meaning that you can believe that Jesus Christ is who he is, but that doesn't mean you're going to walk in the way of the Lord. You see how I would, that's how I would say, I would separate that out, um, Go ahead, maybe Caleb, go ahead. I have two thoughts. <clears throat> In regards to what you were saying, it can be confusing sometimes because people get hung up on not being saved by their works. But um, it, that's, that's true in the sense that somebody can have works and not have faith. Yes. But, but somebody who has faith should have works. Absolutely. But how does, uh, how does one know the righteous way? Well, that's, I, I have a second thought about that. Yeah. So the second thought about that is that even though the law wasn't in stone yet, right. that there you see all through Genesis, and my mom Moses was in the that too, at least pretty the writing. And you see all through Genesis, there does seem to be instruction given by God, and almost like an implied understanding of God's will that you see throughout the Genesis. So you see sacrifices. You, it's talked about clean and unclean animals in the time of Noah mm -hmm. being put onto the ark. Mm -hmm. You see um, the way that, like, what happened with Tamar and and uh, Judah, and the way that that was handled. All of that is something that's talked about later in the law. Um, you see, and then there's there's more specific instruction given by God to Abraham about like, circumcision. And about the covenant between him and, and God. And so you see an aspect of knowing God and knowing what is right. We're in, we're in the passage that talked about upholding justice. Um, you see God's judgment on, on places like Sodom and Gomorrah that were not just. Right, right. So you see an aspect of knowing God and knowing his will even before the laws were written in stone. I would agree with that. I just uh, see us today uh, in our world, this is that whether it be myself or others, that uh, 
we, we see a righteousness that is of our own and not of that of Christ. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, and so you know, I think to myself that uh, uh, as we daily live, we battle with that um, understanding of what is the proper way. And the proper way is the way of the Lord. Right. Not my way. Right. Right. And, and again, I, if I would define it, I would say faith is involved in that. It has to be. It, it has to be. Yeah. But to, to me, the way of the Lord is it's obedience That's to Christ. Word. It's obedience um, to, to God, to His commands. Um, like the, the metaphor that was given this morning, um, we're talking about building your house on the sand, building your house on the rock. Now, if you go to that text and actually read it, it's obedience. It's obedience yeah, that is the rock. Okay? And so many people read Christ in that. And don't get me wrong, Jesus Christ is the foundation, but not in that parable. It was obedience. Because if you look at them, they, they, they heard the word, but yet they were not obedient. And then the rains came, and the house was washed away. But the other one heard, and they were obedient. And that's why it was built on the foundation. And again, it would be obedience to Christ, who is, of course, the foundation um, that, that, that Paul talks about. Um, the, the apostles, the foundation of the apostles who spoke about Christ, foundation of the truth. Um, you could also read Christ, he's not the foundation, he's the cornerstone. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. You wouldn't say Christ is the cornerstone in that parable. So, again, it, you have to keep all of these thoughts cohesive and keep them in context. But um, the, the way of the Lord, by faith, it, again, we're not justified by works. The New Testament is clear on that the whole way through. Numerous times it tells us you're not justified by works. But yet, we're justified by faith. And then again, James comes at it the other direction and says, show me your faith without your works. And, and it's impossible. Because if you don't have the works, you don't have the faith. Or if you do have the faith, it might be a demon faith or a dead faith. Um, so that's how, that's how James, that's what I love about Scripture. It comes out from both sides. Uh, and then you think of, of the time of the judgment where he says, you know, remember the books are opened up? And we're going to have to give an account for everything that we've done. And Paul's writing that to the church. And he's telling them, you're going to have to give an account. So how does that work? Well, again, you're going to have to give an account and you're going to have to look at your life and you're going to say, okay, well, you were obedient here. You was obedient here. You were obedient there. You lived as if you had a law. Remember Jesus' words in, in Matthew 7, 21? He says, you lived as if I had never given you a law. He says, you, you practiced lawlessness. So again, it, it's all cohesive. Um, with faith, you're going to have that. Okay? And, and you're going to have works that comes with that. And if you don't have faith, you're not going to have the works. And your life's not going to represent. So, and that's the scary thing, especially Matthew 7, 21, because they're crying out, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? And, he's, and he says, no. He says, I never knew you. Hear that word again? I never knew you. You, you see how this all, it all is so cohesive. It all ties together. Um, so, I, a couple more examples here to show you. In, in 1 Peter 1.20, he indeed was foreordained, same word, prognosco, okay? He was foreordained. He knew him, but here's the fuller sense of it. Before the foundation of the world, and of course this is talking about Christ, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest. He was made known in these last times. 
Paul often talked about a mystery. The gospel was a mystery. It was hidden. It was hidden through Scripture, hidden through Isaiah 53. People didn't understand it completely. Um, and then it was made known. It was manifest in last times. But look at ESV. He was foreknown. You see how... Now here, the King James, it's the exact same word in the Alexandrian and the Byzantine, but look at, how they, look at how they're using it. One says he was foreordained, which is accurate. The other one says he was foreknown, which again, that's the actual word. But in foreknowing, there's more implied there. God was specifically involved. He not only knew him, but he was involved. Um, so again, it was four note. And then this one's interesting because look, even the NIV, NIV is a paraphrased version. So they read, the, they read the Greek text and then they interpret it according to their theology. Okay? And, and that's the dangerous part. I want the text. Um, but yet all of them do it, just not as much as the NIV. But look at how they say it. He was chosen. So again, a lot like the Old Testament where it says he was known, Abraham was known, or God knew him, and then it says God chose him. So again, this is, um, it, it's all through the Bible. Amos, Amos 3.1. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken against you. O children of Israel. Okay, so again, we're talking of the children of Israel. Against the whole family which I brought you up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I yadate, known. Remember that word. Remember I gave you all the, all the, everything that that means. Okay? I have known of all the families of the earth. So again, we have to think here. Did God not know all the other families of the earth? Well, no, of course he did. But he knew them. In a special way. Remember he says, you are a special people. You are a treasure above all the other nations. Okay? Now, look at NASB. Like I said, very literal. NASB. They call them the sons of Israel. Same thing. Children of Israel, sons of Israel. Has spoken against you. Um, and it says, you only have I chosen. Again, because there's more implied than God just knew them, but that God was active and that God was working in them. Okay? So he says, you only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. And see, this is where a lot of people get hung up. Well, that's not fair. That's not right. But that's, that's Scripture. And that's what it teaches, not only in the Old Testament, but in, in the New Testament. And this is where a lot of people don't, they, they fall so short, okay? Uh, oh, my. Well, we ran a little bit long in, in church, uh, so that's why we're a little bit late here now. So let's do this one here, and then we'll close. There is, there is more, but not much more. Sanctification. What does sanctification mean? That God is working in us. Um, the word sanctify comes from... Maybe we'll leave some of this for next week. Hagiosmos in the Greek, okay? Hagiosmos in the Greek. But I gave you this verse because it, it shows you the sanctification, and it's by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Okay, so the Spirit causes both of those. The belief in the truth, but also of the sanctification process the purifying, or the setting apart, okay? Um, and we'll leave it go with this, but when Paul uses, um, when he was writing to the saints, S-A-I-N-T-S, -S, that word in the Greek is the hagios. He was writing to the purified ones, the holy ones, and you can also think of the set-apart ones. Um, in the Old Testament, when, when they sanctified the instruments that was going to be used in the temple, they purified them. So you have the purification, sanctified, but they also set them apart. They was only to be used in the temple. So you have the idea of being set apart as well. And then we as believers, 
We are purified. The sanctification process began by belief in the truth. God has wrought that in us. He has born us again, born by the Spirit. Remember that from John chapter 3 in, in the conversation with Nicodemus. You have to be born from above. Okay? And then a little bit later on here in Peter, we're going to see where he talks about being born again. Okay, so we know what he's talking about. But we have belief in the truth, and then we have the sanctification process, which again, we can think of it as a purification process, as, as like Tom mentioned, we struggle. In, in our very early Christian days, we might be struggling with very childish things in our walk with Christ. But as we grow, we're conformed to the image. We walk as He walked. Um, and we grow in our understanding. And we learn um, and, and how we're to live. And then our life should represent that. And again, if it doesn't, then that's a very serious situation. That may mean that the Spirit has never began the work that is in you that Paul talks about. So setting apart as well. We're set apart for Him for His service, and also for His will, for His purpose. Um, and I, verses ringing through Philippians 2.10, uh, where, where Paul's uh, talking about that. So we'll close here. We'll pick it up next week. We'll talk a little bit more about sanctification and, and that Greek word, um, hagios, because that just really jumps off the page. When I read any time and I see saints, because the Catholics have a completely different view of that, but yet, scripturally, the saints literally means the holy ones, or the chosen ones, or the sanctified ones, um, or the purified ones. And you'll see all those translations throughout different, um, different translations of the Bible, which is interesting to read some of them as well. So, let's close with, uh, with a word of prayer. Father, again, thank you for your word. Thank you, um, Lord, that you have given us an abundance of it. Thank you, Father, for uh, many teachers, not only today, but, but in years past, um, who, have, who have rightly divided the word of truth. And men, like, like even your word talks about how we had to have the foundation of the apostles, the, the truth about who Christ was. And Lord, we are so grateful um, for that. That, that we can stand on their shoulders and, and yet we can rightly divide your word that we might know you and that we might understand your ways. Father, wherever we fall short, um, give us a desire, Lord, that we might dig in, that we might study to show ourselves approved as work with unto God. And give us that desire, Lord. We know that only comes from you. But then, Father, we pray that you would reveal your truth to that. That's the, the flip side of the coin, Lord, we know that if our eyes are blind, we can't see. So we need you to take the blinders off and to continually reveal your truth with us. Be with us, Lord, as we go here from today. And, and we pray, Father, for those who are not with us, that you would uh, continue to work in their lives. Give them strength and encouragement. And, and that we may all sharpen one another wherever we are. And that we may grow closer to you and ultimately found in your image of your son, Jesus Christ. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Amen.